are very trivial and silly, but when you are called of God and when you have a bigger picture, an understanding of what life is all about, even to your very last moments, you're investing in others and you're thinking about eternity, and that is exactly what is happening here in the life of the Apostle Paul. In fact, I find it quite touching to hear Paul say in verse 21 to Timothy, Timothy, do thy diligence to come by winter. Paul was anxious to see Timothy. No one was more precious to him than this spiritual son. Uh, no doubt uh, they met there at Lystra. I believe one of the first glimpses of, of Paul that Timothy ever had was when Paul was stoned and left outside of Lystra. And, and it was there that he saw this preacher man in a pool of blood and surrounded uh, with a pile of rocks. And, and there was something in his heart that must have understood the love of the Apostle Paul. And no doubt, Paul loved the church there. And he had nearly given his life for it. And, and uh, Timothy had been so faithful ever since. Timothy had avoided the drifting of heart and the drifting of philosophy that some younger men would experience. He seemingly avoided the idea of differentiating himself from his mentor. He was a young man that was holding to the truth and not looking back. It's interesting to me that there are a generation of younger men who have built nothing, not a bus route, not a Sunday school class, not a church, and they're so willing to tell men who have built something what they need to change. Now don't misunderstand me, I, I have no trouble learning from a younger man and I have no trouble maybe changing or adapting something technologically, methodology wise, we can certainly learn, but the fact of the matter was Timothy well understood Paul was the apostle and he had this heart to learn and his goal in life was not to differentiate himself from the apostle but in the proper spirit of mentorship to somehow emulate the strengths of this great man of God. And so as Paul is writing to Timothy and of course we could spend many, many weeks in these chapters but as we look at this last portion of this challenge and this last will and testament I want you to notice three final admonitions that are given to this preacher, Timothy. I want you to notice, first of all, the fight of the apostle. He speaks about the ministry as a battle, and he says something very amazing to Timothy in verse 14. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. You know, I believe at times we can make a mistake when we try to uh, characterize the ministry as just a constant youth activity, a constant Bible school, a constant uh, summer camp. I really believe the Apostle Paul was laying it down on the line and he was letting Timothy know, listen, Timothy, the ministry is a battle and I want you to know we have some enemies along the way and the devil's going to fight and do everything he can to destroy uh, the work of God. In fact, you'll recall uh, the very famous words of the apostle in verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. It is a battle. And it seems like the battle is at every level. We have the world, the flesh, and the devil. We have uh, recently Democratic candidates for president who were asked if they were elected president, uh, uh, would they take away the tax exemption from churches uh, if churches actually taught in the pulpit that marriage is between a man and a woman and just that fast Beto O'Rourke and others said yes we would take away uh, the tax exemption there is no doubt uh, that there's an attack today on the religious liberties of Americans in this land there is no doubt today that there's an attack on the word of God by the liberal element it's been going on and it's a resurging matter even to this day the emergent church and it's touched in entire cities here in Michigan and across this country we see uh, the rampant uh, compromise theologically I'm just saying the devil's fighting the church house and he's fighting in the government house and he's fighting in the home he's always fighting and Paul said I have fought a good fight the question tonight is not will you face a battle tomorrow or will I face a battle tomorrow the question is will we stand in that battle in the power of the Holy Spirit and fight that battle and Paul said I have fought a good fight and, and and he reminds Timothy of this. And I think so 
so vitally so. He reminds him of the presence of opposition. He says here in verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Now, consider the identity of this particular man, Alexander the coppersmith, and I find this interesting. We read about him in Acts chapter 19, we're introduced to him in verse 33, it says, And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, and the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand, and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana uh, of the Ephesians. And what you find in Acts 19 is that Alexander was beckoning on behalf of the Apostle Paul. He was an ally of the Apostle Paul. He was uh, identifying at that moment with him. Later we read about uh, Alexander in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19, however. And the Bible says here, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. I think one of the hardest lessons in ministry for all of us is to learn to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. It could have been that back at Ephesus when Paul uh, was there in the midst of that revival and, and uh, people were burning their curious arts and witchcraft and, and then the persecution was coming against him and, and, and Alexander was someone that spoke up for him. It could have been that Paul might have thought, boy, it's a good thing that Alexander's on our side. But I'm going to tell you something. Some of the very people that tell you in ministry, I love you, preacher. I'm with you, preacher. I'll take a bullet for you, preacher. Might put a bullet in you five years later. Our trust must not be in men, it must be in God. And Alexander the coppersmith was one that had fallen away from his uh, identity with the Apostle Paul. And, and Paul saw that Alexander was one who had made his life a shipwreck. He had lost faith and gone against his conscience. And Paul says that he had to turn Alexander over to Satan that he might learn not to blaspheme. And, and, and imagine uh, uh, coming to that level of church discipline. I mean, sometimes we think about Matthew 18 and, and very few churches have ever had uh, a public moment where they uh, publicly name and, and uh, for the sake of restoration get involved in Matthew 18 discipline. Much less have you ever seen a service where someone is turned over to Satan. I've had a few times I'd like to have some services like that. But we just never have done it. Maybe I'm a compromiser. Maybe you guys do it out here in Michigan every Sunday. I don't think so. But that's what it had come to with Alexander the coppersmith. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 and 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Paul uh, may have had to administer this type of discipline on Alexander uh, in order to seek out repentance. And if this is the same Alexander, and it appears to be from Acts to 1 Timothy, uh, then we see that he has abandoned his faith and he's become bitter toward toward the one that was trying to reconcile him, toward the one that had tried to discipline and restore him. We find uh, Alexander the coppersmith, uh, if you could say it this way, a former church member now bitter at the Apostle Paul. We see the identity of the man. I want you to see the injury of the man. Paul says, and notice this please, in verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Much evil. He was troublesome. He was injurious. You know, sometimes you need to tell a younger man in ministry that there are, are going to be some hurts in the ministry. That there will be sometimes people that are destructive and baneful in their very existence and their heart is malicious toward the work of God. And I've seen over the years, I've had many uh, instances where we've had to deal with someone because of their, uh, their immorality and maybe it wasn't widely known in the church, but uh, because we had to deal with them about some particular issue and somewhere along the line then they get on the Facebook and they begin to spew against the church or maybe we had to deal with someone because of some other kind of a problem in their life 
life and they, they did not become restored un, un, under the Lord and instead they became bitter. They began to blame the ministry and every problem in their life stems back to that church and those fundamentalists and that problem and, and they become very toxic in their persona. That's Alexander the Coppersmith. A bitter, toxic person. And Paul says, Timothy, the presence of opposition is real. It is from within. It is from without. And so notice the warning that he gives. We see the presence of opposition. Notice the warning he gives in verse 15. It says, of whom thou wear or beware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Do you know what I find in mentoring relationships? All the older pastor is trying to do when he says this is help spare problems for the younger pastor. He said, Timothy, look, at this guy has fought me every step of the way. He's bitter. He's toxic. We had to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, hoping that maybe he would come back to the Lord. I just want you to know the guy is nothing but trouble. And there are some people in life who are pathological antagonists. It is in their DNA. They misconstrue what you say, what you preach. They gossip on the internet. It's just the way they are. I was over in the Philippines one time with uh, Brother Rick Martin, and we were talking about the ministry, and, and we were walking down the street, and there's some dogs kind of roaming around, and some of the students with us were going to try to pet the dogs. And Brother Martin said, don't, don't touch those dogs. He said, Brother Chapel, these dogs are like some real rough people you deal with in ministry. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, a lot of them are rabid. And he said, you put your hand out to be nice, but they're going to bite you every time. And when they bite you, they're going to infect you. And he said, that's all a rabid dog knows how to do is bite and infect. And Alexander the coppersmith was rabid. He did much evil to the work of God. And so Paul says, Timothy, beware also. Keep your eyes open. Timothy, as you give oversight in Ephesus, I want you to watch out for this situation. I, I want you to understand that he withstood our words. And by the way, that's what the devil hates the most is the word of God getting into the hearts of men. Paul's not saying, well, he made me feel bad, so fight for me. That was not the crux of the battle. We, we're not calling the next generation to fight the battles of this generation. Look, at, you don't need to fight uh, the battles between the universities. You don't need to fight the battles between, you know, this dead pastor and that dead pastor, right? That's not what this was about. But it is about the Word of God. And Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, you've got to beware and you've got to fight your battle because the battle is over the Word of God. And, and Titus, uh, uh, Timothy, you've got to understand that Alexander was withstanding God's Word. Isn't it amazing how Satan fights the preaching of the Word of God? Uh, I've seen so many funny things during services and uh, we, it just, it just, you know, anymore, it, it hardly surprises me, but we've had dogs run in, we've had people walk in and throw Coke bottles, we've had uh, the lights go off numerous times, I've, we've had the police arresting guys with long knives during the service. It's hard to preach when everyone's watching the guy get arrested. <laughs> and it's amazing to me how Satan likes to get our attention off of the Word of God. We were starting college a few well, about a few months ago, I guess now, several weeks ago, and, and uh, we had a wonderful group of freshmen coming in, and a lot of parents were with them, and there was this one, this one family, I took a picture with them by the donut wall. How many of you love donut walls? Boy, those are great. And we're standing there, and I took a picture with them, and I just sensed when I was talking to this, this family that uh, they were maybe not saved. And I was, you know, trying to discern the, the parents that were coming in and what, what their spiritual condition was. And it seemed like every time there was a service where they would come in, something would happen and they would walk out. And they'd have a phone call, they'd have this, they'd have that. And even the Wednesday night service, they came, but they came late, they left a little early. And it, it just seemed like there was always a distraction for them. After that Wednesday evening service, I found these folks and I... I said, it's been nice to have you here these last few days, and we're glad your son AJ's in the college. And, and uh, I said, folks, let me ask you a question. I said, do you know for sure if you died that you'd spend eternity in heaven 
Have you ever settled that issue in your own life? They'd come all the way from Hawaii with their son and they kind of put their heads down. They said, we're Catholic. I said, oh, that's all right. I said, my, my wife was Catholic. I said, that's really not the question. The question really is more about a relationship with the Lord. And they said, well, we need to go right now. I said, all right, I'll tell you what. I'm going to be up in my office all morning tomorrow and I just want you to feel free to come by and, and, uh, and, and see me if you have any questions about this matter. I'll be glad to talk with you. You know, it was amazing that Thursday morning. I mean, I had appointments just stacked, stacked, stacked. I had about a 10-minute spot. The secretary said, that family's here from Hawaii. They want to talk to you. And they came up into the office, and they were gloriously saved. We called their son, AJ. They came up. We took a picture, and we hugged and prayed. And, and you know, the fact of the matter was, the devil didn't want them to hear the word that week. But when people come under the Word of God, it is quick, it is powerful, it is life-changing. And here we see the importance of God's Word and and yet the battle that is waged against it. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 1, uh, chapter 4 and verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The Bible says evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The devil's always deceiving. He's always drawing people away. But our job is to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and to preach the Word of God. And Paul the Apostle simply saying, Timothy, it's going to be a battle. Not everyone's going to say, welcome to town. Uh, Alexander the coppersmith didn't mean much evil. And I want to say it doesn't feel good. You've had it. I've had it. But that's one of the marks of ministry is when the battle is raging. Notice, secondly, not only the fight of the Apostle the flight from the apostle the flight from the apostle look at verse 16 it says uh, rather uh, uh, look here at verse uh, 10 it says for demas hath forsaken me demas hath forsaken me notice verse 16 at first answer no man stood with me but all men forsook me now when i read these verses i my heart sinks I think of the Apostle Paul in that damp prison, maybe a couple of miles from the Roman Forum, just uh, from the Roman Colosseum, just down the Forum at the, end of the, at the end of the way, built about 500 B.C. It was already a very old prison. You could probably get 30 or 40 bodies in there and they crammed it in with people. And here he is in this prison awaiting death And amongst the main things on his mind are the people that had forsaken him. The people that he had invested in, preached to, prayed for, discipled, people that he tried to help that had completely left the faith that were no longer speaking to him. And in fact, he says in verse 16, at my first answer, no one stood with me. If I understand this properly, In this particular time of the Roman government, you were given three opportunities for defense. You could stand and you could plead your case three different times and you had your day in court, so to speak. And Paul says that when he went for his first time, at his first time, no man stood with him. Some scholars believe Alexander the coppersmith stood against him at that day. Sometimes in the ministry there are battles and sometimes there is loneliness. And Paul says, Timothy, I I want you to understand that that you may be forsaken by your friends. He says in verse 16, they all forsook me. And as he awaited uh, this uh, martyrdom under the leadership of Nero, he he said, I I I want you to realize that that uh, I've had to be here alone, Timothy. Would you try to come before winter because I'd really like to see your face just one more time. And as, as I'm at this first trial, I'm realizing that while there are a few believers around me, not even one of them came to be with me. Here we see a forsaking by his friends. We also hear about some friends who prayed. Some friends who were concerned for him. We, we hear that Luke was with him. And by the way, thank God for those that care. There's two people in the church, two categories you might say. There's the pastor and there's those that help the pastor. 
If you're not a pastor tonight, can I encourage you? Be a Luke. Luke is with me. Don't be a Demas. Don't, don't let yourself feel like, well, someone's got to correct Brother Hal. Someone's got to keep him humble. Can I tell you something? The devil will keep him plenty humble. You make it your mission to encourage him in the ministry. We see the fight of the apostle. We see the flight from the apostle. But notice finally tonight the fortification of the apostle. The Bible says in verse 17 these wonderful words. It says, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Let's say that together. Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Here we see the strengthening of the Lord. And we see the Lord stood with him. And this is absolutely the only way that we will stand is as the Lord stands with us. And Paul found that God's strength in him was sufficient. He said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The Lord had kept his promise. The Bible tells us about it in Acts 9 and 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. God said, I'm going to use you greatly, and you're going to suffer greatly, but I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you my grace will be sufficient for you and here we see that the Lord was standing with him keeping his promises to him and preserving him every step of the way and yes we're going to have criticisms and yes we're going to have enemies and yes we're going to have days of loneliness but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever and he will strengthen us and stand with us whether we be in a jail cell or whether we be a heart broken over someone that just criticized or someone that just left the church no matter what's going on in your life or ministry Jesus is there all the time he stood with me he strengthened me in fact he preserves us the Bible says in verse 17 that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion speaking I believe here of standing before Nero that first time he's saying God preserved me at that first hearing no one else was with me but God was with me and he said God's gonna preserve me uh, in every single situation whether in life or in death we are on the winning side in Jesus Christ. And so Paul the Apostle was simply testifying that it was the strength of the Lord that had brought him thus far. And it would be the strength of the Lord that would help him to carry on. But I want you to see very quickly, not only the strengthening of the Lord, which is our only hope, but the encouragement of Timothy. The encouragement of Timothy in his life. Look at verse 19. It says, Salute Prisha and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. These certainly were great encouragers to Paul. Erastus abode of Corinth, Trophimus, have I left it, my lead him sick. Verse 21, do thy diligence to come before winter. Now, here we see that Paul looked for the moment to be reunited with this student. This Timothy. Perhaps you, like I have endeavored in my life, have mentored some men in the ministry. Some, some you'll never hear from again. Some will choose a different direction. And what's great about that is when they do, and then they blame you for their direction. <laughs> Has it ever occurred to you that people actually can make up their own minds when they become adults? I think I can understand a little bit of Paul's heart here. If you've been in the ministry any while at all, there's some people you preach to and you train and you work with them and, 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 and it seems like they'll, they'll go right along in the doctrine and the philosophy and the soul winning. It's amazing, like Timothy, to see God at work in their life. There's another category. They'll do some things differently, some things you didn't teach them, but at least they have a sweeter spirit towards you. They call you up. They talk to you once in a while. There's, there are others, perhaps like a Demas, that not only are taking a radically different path, but their spirit is completely different. I think Paul's kind of surveying in his mind all these people that he had mentored, all these people that he had known. Some were very caustic, like Alexander, and others he didn't even know who they were, like Demas. But 
when he thought about Timothy, he thought, you know, I'd like to see him one more time before I die. He encourages my heart. May I say to the younger pastors tonight, there's nothing more encouraging to someone who's been at the battle for a while than to see a young millennial type pastor standing up with the word of God being faithful. Such a great encouragement Timothy was. And here we see Paul had one great desire to see him before winter. That may have involved, if I understand, the traveling from where Timothy was to get all the way around the sea and back down into Rome. It may have been several months journey. What Paul literally was saying was, hey, Timothy, leave right now. If I'm going to see you, you've got you've to leave right now. Come, come diligently. Come quickly. Start your journey now. I, 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 the Lord is with me. He's helped me, but I'd sure like to see you one more When I think about Timothy and Titus, I am so thankful for men who received and held to and died faithfully serving the Lord Jesus Christ. A couple months ago, or maybe a month or so ago, I was privileged to spend a few days on the island of Crete, and I had read quite a little bit about Titus's ministry there, and you know from Titus, he was told to set in order the things that we're wanting. He was to ordain elders in every city. He was to raise them up so that they could preach and defend the faith. And I like to envision in my mind what that must have been like. I mean, imagine there's these believers from what we can tell. They had come to know the Lord at, uh, on the day of Pentecost and the Cretans. And now they've come back. And there's not a lot of good things said about the Cretans. They're slow bellies and they're all these different things. And so here you are, Titus, right? And, and Paul says, I want you to go to Crete. He said, I don't know a lot about it. I was shipwrecked there one time, you know. And I've heard about these people. I want you to go there. I want you to go all around this island. I forget, I think the island's like 135 by 40. I want you to walk around this, this, uh, this island uh, inhabited by pagans for many hundreds of years and I want you to find those little bodies of believers, those, find those few houses in every village where people were saved and then when you find them, Titus, I want you to identify the emerging leader amongst them. I want you to ordain the elders in every city. I want you to train pastors in every city and I want you to do such a good job of setting things in order so that Christianity will go on and churches will prosper. How many of you understand? Missionary work is not an easy work either. And so we came to this little village of Gryton, G-R-Y-T-O-N. And we went there. It was not a tourist thing for the normal tourist activity. It was just something I'd read about and found. And we hired someone to take us. And sure enough, we walked into this ancient ruin. There was a church that had been constructed in the latter part of the third century they called it traditionally the church of titus i had read about these 10 men that had been trained in the about the year 180 probably trained by men that titus himself had trained 10 pastors those 10 pastors were brought to this city of Griton and they were told by the Roman Emperor Decius that everyone was to worship the Roman Emperor as God and in that particular island of Crete the governor's name was also Decius and so he brought these ten spiritual leaders that had become the descendants they were the descendants of the ministry of Titus and his ministry of the Apostle Paul and they brought these ten pastors together and they said we want you to recant your faith in Jesus Christ and we command you to worship Decius the Roman Emperor and they refused to do so and they were placed into a prison and they uh, they experienced uh, many different tortures for 30 days they were drug all around around uh, the Roman uh, amphitheater and they were uh, beaten and, and told that they would die if they did not worship Decius and after 30 days they were brought to that Roman theater and one by one by one they were beheaded because they would not deny their faith in Jesus Christ and we found a local man in that village who said I can I can show you where they unearthed in the archaeological digs the ten graves of the martyrs. I'll never forget going down into an underground area and seeing one, two, three, taking the pictures and thinking to myself, 
God, help me to be faithful unto death. Amen. Help us to train a generation of men so that no matter what Washington, D.C. would say, so that no matter what the liberal church establishment would say, that when the moment of testing comes, no matter who is spewing out against them, no matter uh, how great the Alexander the Coppersmith's pressure might be, that they will, having done all to stand, stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and even die for the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that He will stand with them every step of the way. I believe I'm speaking to some men and perhaps some women tonight Someone has done you much evil. You've experienced betrayal and hurt. You've had perhaps the tightest that thrills your heart, but there's been a Demas that has broken your heart, and I want to encourage you tonight that the Lord wants to stand with you. Amen. That the Lord will bring you through it, that if God brings you to it, He'll bring you through it by His grace. He'll help you to find another Timothy and another Titus and to continue preaching the Word of God and doing your best to raise them up so that they might be faithful for the Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy, come before winter. May every one of us tonight be helping to train the Timothys and may we have the spirit of a Timothy to encourage the men of God in our lives tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you for the faithfulness of the Apostle Paul, even unto death. But Lord, we also thank you for Timothy. We thank you for the fact that he would carry on the gospel message. And Lord, we pray tonight for those in this room who have been dealing with Alexander the Coppersmith. They've had their heart broken by a Demas. Oh Lord, you say in your word that you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us, that you will strengthen us and stand with us. So I pray that we would cling to that promise tonight and that we would realize that you are enough and that you will sustain us and help us. Our heads are bowed tonight and our eyes are closed and I'd like to ask you a question or two. And I wonder tonight in this auditorium how many preachers, how many Sunday school teachers, perhaps a bus captain, how many tonight would say, Brother Chapel, the ministry gets messy. I thought people would just appreciate that we're just trying to help. But I've had an Alexander the coppersmith do me some evil. It's been pulling me down a bit. That, that I've had a Demas or two. And tonight I believe God wants me to get my eyes off of Alexander and off of Demas. Get my eyes back on the Lord and back to a Timothy or two. And start over again if necessary. But I am convinced that the Lord is standing with me. And Brother Chapel, I want to lay some hurt and some disappointment down at this altar tonight. And I want to ask the Lord to help me to touch another Timothy for the glory of God. Is there someone like that? You've had some hurt, some disappointment, and God wants you to lay it down and keep on going for him. Would you lift your hand tonight? Is there anyone else tonight? You've seen some fruit that then fell by the wayside. Is there someone else? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. God bless you. I wonder tonight if I might speak to every teenager, to every college student, if I could take the liberty to speak to a younger pastor. I'll not define what that is age-wise, but the Holy Spirit will tell you. And certainly you're not to be faithful for the older generation. We're to be faithful to the Lord, but I wonder if there isn't a younger person here tonight who would say, you know, Brother Chapel, I'd like to be the kind of Christian that when some battle-wearied pastor thinks of me, he would like me to come. He would like to see me, that my presence would encourage my pastor, that my presence would encourage that man of God. And you might say, I'm not a preacher tonight, but I would like to come before winter if I'm ever needed. I want to be a blessing. If God speak into your heart about being a blessing to those that would preach the Word of God, may I pray with you, would you lift your hand tonight if God speak into your heart? Maybe a teenager, maybe a college student, maybe a staff member. I want to be that one. 
that's asked for to come before winter. God bless you. Our Father in heaven, I want to pray for every Christian worker who's dealing with an Alexander, who's dealing perhaps with a Demas, who's, who's bearing a difficult situation in their heart. Lord, not everyone that we teach, not everyone that we mentor is going to follow the path that we've tried to show them scripturally. Help us to have grace in our hearts. Help us to have strength that comes from you standing with us. Father, would you minister to these tonight with grace and mercy? Would you help them to know that there's someone else that needs their love and encouragement? And then I pray for those many young people and younger pastors who said, I'd like to be that one that comes before winter. I'd like to be that encouraging one to some man of God. Bless the staff that raised their hands and others, Lord. Use them to be that Barnabas, that helper, that encouragement that they desire to be. And Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that's not a Christian, that never has settled the fact that their sin is forgiven, they're on their way to heaven, they'd like to know more about the faith, I pray that you would bring them tonight to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.